All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Christy from Honey Mamas. Thanks for joining. For people who don't know, what does your company do? Our company is Honey Mamas. We make a line of products that are all sweetened with raw honey, and they are intended to be your next favorite chocolate bar or your chocolate bar replacement. And they are. They are made with just whole food ingredients, and they are refrigerated. So they, we don't use any emulsifiers or preservatives, and so all the ingredients are just body loving and whole and nutrient rich. Body loving, and that's why it has to be refrigerated. All right, let's go to the beginning. What made you want to start this company? What was the thing that you saw on the market? In uh, the early 2000s, I owned a bakery and coffee roasting company with my mom and my sister. That's cool. And it was. It was a wild ride. Smelled good every day, It I'm did, sure. and we made incredible cinnamon rolls and chocolate cakes oh. and pecan rolls and lemon custard tarts and all those wonderful things. And I actually just really never felt very well when I ate sugar and or wheat. I realized later that I had a wheat allergy, but just didn't know it. And so I just didn't ever eat a whole lot of the products that we made, but the entrepreneurship was really there for me. And my mom was the creative baker and it was just a really amazing experience. We had a brick and mortar space, we did farmer's markets, we sold our cinnamon rolls and pecan rolls and coffees at the grocery stores uh, regionally. And so it was kind of, I dipped my toes, I think in the CPG world back sure. then. Okay. And fast forward about seven or eight years in business, it was 2010. And my dear best friend at the time had a really severe autoimmune disease called myasthenia gravis. And I didn't know what it was, and she didn't know what it was. Myasthenia but she gravis. was having these issues where her muscles were giving out on her. And it was kind of a diagnosis like an MS kind of a thing. And so she got the diagnosis, but no resolve as far as what could help it. So it's um, rare or is it just... I think it's fairly rare. Okay. You know, I have been talking about it for years and, and I feel like people will re reach out after I do interviews like this or whatever and Got they'll it. say, oh, I have that or okay. my cousin has that. But for her, it was just very debilitating and so she was scared and her Tai Chi teacher at the time recommended this cleanse called the Body Ecology Diet. And I mean, this is 2010. So there wasn't a whole lot of like even gluten allergy awareness at that time. It was kind of just beginning. Yeah. And he said, this is just kind of a gut health focused cleanse. I would recommend it to you just to help. Maybe you'll discover something about your diet that's causing your health issues. And so... It was a month-long cleanse. It was very focused on probiotics and eating uh, cultured vegetables and things like that. So it was kind of like a um, candida-focused diet. And so I did it with her as a support. Wow. She turned her autoimmune disease around completely wow. and discovered that she was a celiac. Okay. And then I felt better than I had felt in years. I had two little kids at the time. I was running around after them all the time. I was, ha I had off and on like anxiety during my life and was definitely having it at that time because I was kind of breaking from the family business at the bakery and sure, stress, so I was kind of going through my own thing. Yeah. And anyway, it changed my life. It changed her life. And I, what had did you this... learn during the cleanse outside of your, you felt better, but what was the, I... the experience of it? The experience of it was it was based on essentially cutting all the sugar out of your diet and eating only whole foods that were in their kind of pure form. So that's where I learned about unrefined oils, soaking your nuts and seeds if you eat them. And it was about the, the connection between digestion and health and nurturing your gut in order to create like a microbiome that gives you total body health. And that extends to mental health as well. And so it was a mind blower for me yeah, at the time. I was going to say, yeah, that's wild. It was wild. And I just felt really, really good. And I also, of course, didn't drink any alcohol during this month. And so it was just, a, it was a cleanse. Like it was yeah. a full thing. And I've seen some people do it and it's like their eyes are lighter. Yeah. Their teeth are whiter. Yeah. Uh, that's the, the two things that I walked away immediately from being like, oh my goodness, you, something is happening mm -hmm. behind the scenes where everything's, you're more vibrant, I guess is how I would put it, it in amazing. every way. That's definitely the experience. And she, I mean, her symptoms just went away right away. So she learned how to manage a, an autoimmune disease that she felt totally out of control with. And so running a bakery and also coming from a family that was really rooted in yeah. eating and cooking. And like, that was very much a part of my love language and my culture that I was raised in. And so 
I just started immediately kind of trying to think about how could I actually create a product that was kind of like a gateway drug where it doesn't have to taste like crap just because it happens to be like gluten-free or something on the shelf, which at that time, a lot of things tasted like cardboard that were really good for, or, you know, that were allergy free or whatever. And, um, I just felt like there was a lot more out there to be had. And so I spent a couple of years thinking about some ideas and was going to do like a juice company and, and knew that kind of CPG landscape from, you know, selling the cinnamon rolls and coffees to the grocery stores. So I just thought I want to do a really simple product line and I want it to help open the people's eyes to kind of food as medicine. And that was the beginning of what got me started with Honey Mamas. And That's crazy. Yeah. And so you would think after the cleanse, you're going to probably go into something super, like you mentioned, juices or something extremely really functional. healthy. Yeah, and like what I love about the functional. story, and I hope it ends with Honey Mamas, but what I love about it is you've made something, a treat. Yeah. A treat <laughs> that yeah. satisfied the cleanse requirement? Yeah, yes. That's absurd. Yeah. That's what well, this is? I'm going to so eat so truly, much of it. Say no more. Actually, the Body Ecology Diet Cleanse, the one that I did, there is not honey on that cleanse. Sure. So she really doesn't do any sweeteners. It's like, so this is not, this is like a, this is a it's adjacent. adjacent. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's but close adjacent. enough for me. Close enough for me too. This is such a good story. Yeah. This is and why honey, I love the podcast. You never really know. No. And I think that it's interesting too, because I, I really did start with these like functional ideas because I thought, you know, I was going to do cultured vegetables, which are fine and good, but they stink. And they're not something that I, my daughters were just like, that just stinks every time you open those jars, mom. And I just thought, oh, that's not going to be as easy to sell as something that tastes really flippant good. So it really did pivot my idea. And then, and I tried, you know, coconut sugar and like dates and all these things, which are just fine and good alternatives to cane, to cane sugar sweeteners. And they just didn't have, like I, I started, I put honey in some recipe ideas I was creating and, and I just felt good when I ate it. And so it was kind of like a intuitive body experience too. I was like, I like raw honey. I like all the micronutrients in it. Like it has all these amazing, it's anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antifungal. I was like, okay, so that's healing. Yeah. So what was your first step in going down this path? Or what did you learn about the difficulties of it? Right. And so here you are, you're sort of in some way creating something that exists, but you're stripping out, you're doing an analysis and like this, no good, this, no good, this, no good. How mm -hmm. do we replace that with yeah. something else? Yeah. So I got really interested in raw food is kind of how I ended up here okay. is during that process of trying to think about a product to make that I could sell at the grocery store, which is where people buy their food that they're nourishing themselves with. And I knew that, that I could be a part of the broader conversation at the grocery store, say, versus like having a brick and mortar space. So I really was intentional there. And so when I kind of started going down this path of raw food is where I started realizing like, oh, like, you know, you can use cashews instead of wheat, for example, for crusts, you know, of like a muffin and that kind of thing. And so I wasn't really having a lot of luck and I made these things that I called them bird suet. They were like unrefined coconut oil, almond butter, cocoa nibs, a little bit of cocoa powder, flax seeds, all these like really high nutrient things. And they were like these delicious little protein balls. And I mean, you've probably seen these all over the place now. They're like really common, and but it melted all over the place because it was a raw food. It was coconut oil was the base. And, you know, coconut oil is just a really wonderful fat that our that our brains and our bodies absorb well and do well with and this is a lot of what I learned in the in the body ecology diet and and so when I made these I thought okay I want to do something adjacent to this where sure. it's not like the difference between the buttermilk chocolate cake that we made at the bakery and it's not this like bird suet thing that is really good for me but that's impractical and I can't sell at the grocery store right. and I just kind of tried to play with this recipe idea of turning that protein thing more into a treat and a snack idea and so I just added a bunch of cocoa powder to it and played around with kind of like the honey and the coconut oil and the cocoa powder and the um, and sprouted almonds and so that was my first bar was that's what I used and, and I guess the hard part of this is also at some point you realize it has to be refrigerated yeah and so what is the world gonna be like when they buy a product that you have to refrigerate exactly and the fear around that yeah and so what was this like at least initially for you and the consumer who's not used to that experience yeah such a it's like 
it's a great question and still a million dollar question still today still you today. know here i am like 11 years into the business and it's still a really interesting question for us um as we grow from like the natural grocery channel to more conventional markets and stuff so for me at the time you know that was like 2012 when I really came up with You're the recipe. You're early, really early yeah. in this market. Yeah, so I launched wow. in 2013 at the Portland Farmer's Market. Up in, I'm from Portland, Oregon, and um, that's where I launched the business. And, and at that time, there was a couple of products in, this, in the refrigerator that were like protein-ish. Because once I made it and I realized it was going to have to be refrigerated, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the grocery stores and check this out. What's there? Sure. There was much. But I just had this really strong feeling that it was a good idea. And I mean, I also just felt like it was something that was so delicious. And it's really why I started at the farmer's market, because I thought, no, I'm just going to try check this out. You know, I had I made four flavors. I had one that was just straight up the sprouted almonds, one that had mint oil in it that's still my favorite bar. It's a peppermint bar. And one that had spice, it cayenne pepper and Saigon cinnamon. And another one with a different type of cocoa called Peruvian raw cocoa powder. I'm from Peru. I love it. Oh, there it's, we go. that's that again. That Home was like a best selling bar. Yeah, it still is. Oh, I love that you're from Peru. That's right. <laughs> I forgot. That's why I like chocolate so much. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> and so I honestly just didn't even know, Diego. I mean, that was the thing is I didn't know. I knew I loved it and it made me feel good and it tasted great. And I thought it had some legs for sure. And I knew the farmer's market would give me great feedback. And so I just started, I just kind of had this like, felt like a pretty pure, honest and kind of innocent approach to just dropping off bars to grocery stores. And just, I thought I have nothing to lose. And what would they do with them? Like, what would you tell them to do with them? Would you say, put them next They're to the soft drinks? They're refrigerated, yes. Or like, so like, what fridge do they put them in, right? That's the question. That was the question, and that was where I thought we can have this discovery experience together, and it's either going to hit or it's going to not hit, and I just kind of knew that. And so... Did you and, ever think about making a little Honey Mama's refrigerator? <laughs> like well, a little, that's where we're at now. A little one. <laughs> <laughs> Use two fingers to open the door. We just did a whole marketing campaign about the Is butter right? penthouse okay. with like, you know, the butter part in your fridge. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was yes, really funny. Yes, like that. Yeah. Sponsored by Honey Mamas. Yeah. Okay. So the, where do they put it? Like, so what, where do you end well, up? Like, give me the journey. Because I started at the, at the Natural Grocery Channel, which is where we've really, I've grown for the last 10 years. Yeah. So it they was know. a little bit more straightforward, right? So it's like co-ops, independents, natural grocery stores. Yep. They get it. They're you used know, to not a great example. stable products. Yeah. Right. So it's, they had a space. And so they would immediately say, this is delicious. You know, like Whole Foods Market, for example, our regional Whole Foods Market. Like they, I met them at the farmer's market. And they were like, this is delicious. We would love to bring it into our specialty department. So okay. they went next to cheese and salami. So like a charcuterie oh, idea. That's nice. It that was, but I tell you, it did not sell, a, okay. not a bar. I mean, it was really hard to get people to even know what it was there. I so would have bought it. That's me. I, I would have bought it too, but and I thought it was a great idea, but it really didn't work didn't there work. at the Whole Foods stores, no. And so they, they ended up shifting it. And they just put it next to like some of the other kind of protein bars that were there that were refrigerated. Perfect Bar was there. Hail Mary's was there. So those are two refrigerated treats or, you know, Perfect bars of protein bar, obviously, but um, that was kind of became our home, and that that so those most of those grocery stores like had those products or other local things, and that became, so that worked that worked for them, and that and okay. it was I think it the other thing that happened was I knew that this was something that people had to get in their mouths, and so I just really dedicated to any store that said they would take it, I would set up demos for like the next few months, and I would go in every few weeks and just demo the product and get people to try it and talk about where it was. And so, and once they tried it, it was pretty clear. They were like, no problem. I'll put this in the fridge. That's easy. Yeah. They That's were, how I feel about it. I think it's like, once you know, you know, and then before yeah. you know, you're kind of like, wait, what, where is that? How, how, how can I find that? But do they, and, in that sense, they're buying you for taste, not necessarily the healthy alternative. And so how do you communicate that message so that, cause in some way, in general, when someone's eating chocolate, it mm -hmm. feels like a guilty pleasure, mm -hmm. right? That's just like, call it an American phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And so in that, you're sort of telling them like feel less guilty about it, but do they care? Is that something that's resonating from a marketing perspective? Where do you decide to put your messaging and does it really matter? That's the hard part, I think, right? I mean, you're just asking great questions because for the first, when I first launched the company, it was just me and I didn't, I don't have a marketing background. My idea originally was to just list the ingredients on the front of the package like mm -hmm. RX bar does. And that would be enough. Yeah. 
And I thought that will communicate to people what it is inside. And I, and it, they, the ingredients sound good. So I thought that would sell it. Well, it's not what I, I didn't do a good job of that. I didn't really list them like that. I got into the like beauty of the, this is a different packaging than our first bar, but it was like a craft butcher paper wrapped square. And then I wrapped bright colored labels around it and had this hummingbird and you know, it said what the ingredients were, but they were hard to find. I just kind of flailed on that one, I guess. But I called it Nectar Fudge. That's a good word. Very I called it name. Nectar Fudge. People didn't, you know, I think it was just so much <laughs> word of mouth at first. <laughs> just because people didn't really know. Yeah. And then in 2019, we started looking to do a Series A. Okay. And in 2020, we closed that right about as the pandemic started. Congrats. And we, thank you. It was a really important phase for us because at that point, we finally did a brand refresh. So I'd been in business seven years and um, we chose to focus on the indulgence instead of the trying to make it like a nutrition bar because it really is what it is as a treat. And it's not meant to be a 20 gram protein bar. It's just something that's a treat. And it happens to be very allergen, you know, low allergens. We, you know, the fats that we use are really healing fats. The, the ingredients are pure. So it's just not, it's like a really clean ingredient deck that's yeah. nutrient rich. And that so we let people kind of discover that on their own. So my perspective of this is obviously Jason gave me your product, Jason from Mog. Thank you, Jason. Mm-hmm. And so in that I had it. I had no idea what you're suggesting is the healthiness to it. And so now I just feel like even more of a fan because I bought it because it's delicious and it is that. I would put it against any bar. Yeah. It's going to win. Yeah. But now we're adding that. So now it's like you almost get the customer to buy in in a greater way. Yeah. Which is really cool. Like I'm having a good experience. I feel better about myself than I did earlier today. Yeah. Thinking I was just having this indulgent treat. But that's in reality. Good. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. It's like it, it's, it deepens the relationship to the brand in a way that feels very organic and true to the brand, which is awesome. We're, we really are trying to lean into this like real food element. I think that's, that's kind of the words that we've chosen the last couple of years. And like it's made with five real foods or eight real foods. And so that is this nod to that it's, that it's not just a Reese's or Snickers or whatever. And so I think that it's, we're trying to kind of just lean into simple language that we still keep that indulgent. Like I really related, like when I first started the company to during that era, at least there was like chocolate bars that were, you know, from like Peru or all these different beautiful African cocos. And, and I think that I really was, I, I was influenced by that as a person who was culinary and just loved chocolate. <laughs> I'm going to eat this cause it's, yeah. uh, I feel like it's calling my name. Yeah. That peanut butter cup is something else. That's real addictive. So as I open this, when it came to, so COVID hits, and that mm. sort of unlocks the world to the freezer aisle, the refrigeration section. Now products don't really, not to say they didn't matter that they had to be shelf stable. There was certainly a group of them that were important. But now mm. all of a sudden to the younger consumer, it has unlocked the freezer and the refrigerator section in a whole new way. Mm-hmm. And so I assume this was only was amazing good. for the brand, for the company. Yeah, it was a good time period for us. And I think it's interesting because we had launched a small single serving bar during that time and Grab and go was just going this? down the tubes. Mm-hmm. This is a single serving in my <laughs> house. Okay. Yeah. Good it, to know. It definitely. Um, that bar has just continued to do the best for us. People seem to love that size. They want a smaller bar because they like the grab and go aspect of it to just have it on the go and it doesn't melt and all that. But this one, no matter what, people seem to buy this this big version of the of the bar. And it's just, I think the packaging is really fun too, but... Um, so good. But yeah, during COVID, the pandemic was an interesting time. I think that it worked for us to have the indulgent kind of pleasure aspect of what we're doing. And people needed that a lot during that time, that comfort element and the fact that it was nourishing. And then it's also a gift. So it could be like a small gesture to give other people because everybody we were just all suffering mm. then, especially. Um, and that, I think that's a big part of what I'm trying to do is to just bring some people. Some How many happiness. servings is this? I hate that. That's three. Three. Jesus. Yeah. That's and you know, so I mean, good. the sugars are less sugars than like a typical protein bar, for example. Well, you really let me try. Oh yeah. He's gonna lose. <laughs> that's so good. Eat the whole thing, please. We're not single serving guys. We're like <laughs> we'll eat the whole thing. 
And then someone will say, how many, we're like, how many calories? Like 120. And we're like, per serving? Yeah. They're in the whole per bag. <laughs> and they're like, per serving. I'm like, God, how many servings are in the bag? I have eaten a whole Peruvian raw bar on many occasions as a meal, actually. Because oh. like, you know, especially in my heavy demo days when I'd be going from store to store. Sure. And all I would have in the car was, you know, a cooler full of Honey Mamas. And, you know, it was like eight grams of protein and, you know, it, you know, 20 grams of sugar for the whole bar, which is like a lot of times in a, it's just a lot, a lot worse stuff out there. When it came to you closing your series A, what did the investors see or what did you have to communicate to them? Because the way I think about your story is you're early. So that's really important. Uh, I think you can win if you're early. The refrigerator section would cause probably some question marks, but then you probably have velocities that maybe suggest it doesn't matter. Was that it? Like you, you had the velocities to prove, you know, people are shopping different, let's say. Yeah, I think I think the refrigerator, and this has kind of been the truth since the beginning, the truth since the beginning is it's kind of, is a door opener for us. The fact that it is in the fridge and that we have seen that category pretty much on the rise ever since I started the company in 2013, the categories really opened up quite a bit. It still is obviously, as you know, like clearly you understand like the, the real estate is it's tricky, but it was kind of a good one to disrupt because there wasn't like a ton to disrupt there, but it was really the the candy bar aisle that we're disrupting. We're just doing it in the refrigerator. So I think that what certainly the investors that we were talking to at the time, they definitely saw the kind of momentum that that category was having at the time and that there was no end in sight as far as like how that was going to continue to go up, trend upwards. So that worked well for us. And then the other thing I think that really worked and still does is that we have like a cult following. The people that are dedicated to Honey Mama's like are just kind of goo goo about it. And so that that's me now. I think that that ha- I think that that's always been important. Like that yeah. seemed to carry a lot of weight um, as well. And the investors that we ended up working with, and I think this is interesting. And I have never been an investor yet in my life, and maybe I will one day. I'm sure you will. But I think that it's cool because Alex Bernstein, who's the was the lead investor at Amberstone, is who you know, did that series a with us. And he, he's a fanatic about health and about like you, he, he was, you know, ate on the paleo diet at the time. And I think that that, like, he just loved it. He loved the product. And I, and I have found that with the investors that we worked with, like they, they love the product. They really love the product. And then they also see the, the value for what, it, you know, kind of what it's doing in the market. But I'm sure part of this is also in the deck or maybe on the horizon, but do you think about it like a more creating different flavors, but of the same product or do, obviously we have a different product here, this I don't know what you call that. But you've got in the hands. I like that it's the yes. bites are in the hands. Yeah. The raw honey treats. And so, where do you think about skews wise? At this point, you probably have enough credibility with the retailers. So maybe, what are the retailers seeing yeah. from you know their high level view, national view of this category? And what are they asking you for maybe today as opposed to before you're pitching them on (laughs) where to put your product? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we're seeing is really good velocities in like four packs and of this like the single, so a smaller size, but in four packs. Also in like, so this is our minis size. And so it's a bite size. We're launching into quite a few like, um, oh, like the Meta Campus and Netflix Campus. So a lot of campuses with those like food service. And then this size that we're doing right here, I think that's eight minis in that box. And we actually talked to our Whole Foods buyer about this a couple of years ago. And she was the one who was originally saying like, I think it'd be fun to see a bite sized version of your bars. And I think the consumers would love that. And and it, but if you had like a pouch of them where it's more grab and go. So, you know, that took a while to put out there. And I think that's what we are hearing, especially as we move again, like into some more conventional stores where having it be something that is maybe a smaller size that's a little bit more grab and go seems to be something that, okay. that people are wanting. So that that's where we're definitely focusing our innovation. And, Any partnerships and, with like an airline or something? I know we met somebody, I can't remember who we were talking to, but we met a couple of people at this recent, most recent expo because I think it would be great too. And so, but Same. there is that refrigeration piece. But they have it. Right. They and so it. it can just be with the, the, right. It can be with the boxes that come out um, for lunch or whatever. So we're pretty excited about 
you know, it's funny because I've been doing the business for 10 years or, you know, really 11 years. And I have grown it very slowly, pretty intentionally because there wasn't there wasn't anything like that. And it really is just I think we're at a point where it's it's ready to kind of take move and really, truly kind of launch. I want to get into that. And so, you know, normally we talk about entrepreneurship and of course, everyone wants to become the unicorn tomorrow, raise the Series A next week, the Series B three months later, and then, you know, this phenomenal exit. (laughs) The reality of it, it's it's generally speaking a, a minimum of, of a seven year game. Generally speaking, for you, when you went into this, I think maybe knowing the family business, you sort of understood the day in day out, right? Which is a real hustle, a real grind, and I think every baker is always fearful that no one will come back tomorrow. That's <laughs> that's a real yeah. fear I've learned yeah. with chefs and and probably some bakers. Yeah. When you think about your approach, did it ever bother you? Was it ever in like the back of your head where you saw maybe some other companies just on paper, yes, right, looking like all the success, and here you are taking, you know, the tortoise versus the hare, the tortoise approach. What was that like for you? (laughs) Fear-based. It's just like I just I can get totally into fear mode where it's like ah, you know, I'm not doing anything fast enough or second guessing yourself. Oh, I mean, yeah, it's I feel like it's maybe part Hmm. of the the fuel for entrepreneurship. (laughs) It's like having a healthy dose of fear. But no, when I started the business, I knew it would take a bit. I met Justin from, you know, Justin's Peanut Butter Mm -hmm. at one of the first shows I did. I can't remember if it was Fancy Food or an expo. I feel like it was a Fancy Food show East. He was a speaker on a panel. And he was walking down the aisle after the panel i'd seen him talk as part of this panel and he walked by the booth and i said can i ask you about my products like i was just in business a few years at that point and he said this is really good and he was like i think if you just have some patience with this you're gonna do really really well but it's just gonna maybe take a little bit longer to grow because it's kind of a new thing you know and i and i look back on that i really remembered I took that to heart, you know, and I thought, okay, that's that's interesting insight from that's somebody who's advice. been in this. But like he had sold his company, you know, at that point. And yeah, it was good advice because I kind of needed wow. to hear that from somebody. And I never thought it would be some like five year or seven year turnaround. Really in my heart of hearts, what I wanted to do with this, with the mission, the mission of the company was to put something into the grocery stores that would bring, like I was saying earlier, like bring, open up this conversation about like that food is actually healing for us and things that are healthy don't have to taste bad and that food is medicine, (laughs) like no matter how you slice it. And so just like eking a little bit more awareness into people's practices, I suppose. And so I was hoping for a regional brand that to me that felt like I wasn't, I didn't have a clear vision for like a whole national brand when I first started the company. And so for me, it's been a learning process of what that looks like, like the Series A. Like I was like, oh, okay, so now what happens? Yeah. (laughs) And we... um, And then That's what so I learned honest. was you, just so keep, you keep doing what you already were doing. Yes. You are able are to maybe hire people who actually have done right. the thing before, right? Like marketing. We brought on our first marketing director at that time and it changed the game. And it's been a really interesting learning process and it still is. And so many mistakes along the way. And part of that, I think, is thinking that like people who've done it before are going to always know the best. And yeah. what I've learned you know, 2024 is that I still have a really strong pulse on what is best for the company. And it's really great that the people that I've been able to bring in are, it's critical that those people that we're all kind of, all the arrows are going in the same direction and that we're aligned. It's huge. It's it's kind of amazing. That's the most important part, honestly. When it comes to the company, what other names did you play with? Before you landed on Honey, Honey Mama's, Mama's. Uh, Nectar Foods was Nectar the name Foods. of is still actually the name of the the, the LLC. You know, Nectar Fo- mm-hmm. Okay, I and like that because I actually didn't know if I would only do this this product. Sure. I thought I might do a whole platform right. of different right. products. Still can. I still can. <laughs> yeah, and you know I loved honey, so that's kind of the tongue in cheek aspect for me was from. I have a lot of relatives in the South and Oklahoma. Actually, both of my parents are from. And there was just that kind of vernacular in the culture of my grandparents where I got my love of cooking and, and all of that. So Honey Mamas is really a nod to, 
to them, to my grandmas and my grandpa. But, you know, besides Nitro Foods, I didn't really have a whole lot of other names that I can remember. I just know a friend of mine was like, Nectar Foods is about as boring as you can get. Like, what can you come up with that's a little more interesting? <laughs> that's amazing. What's on deck for the brand? As you think about 2025, I know, always, always the next thing for the entrepreneur. What do you want to bring to market? What are you looking to give the consumer that mm-hmm. you've actually, you know, they've asked you for so many things, I'm sure, but what what's on deck? Truly, I think that our goal is to just get our products into more mouths. And so the best way I think that we can do that is to continue to be in the right places where people are shopping and then turn them on to this product. And so what's on deck for us is to be able to say, okay, so people are buying Honey Mamas as an alternative to a chocolate bar or, you know, candy bar. And so I think Costco is a really important potential player with us because I think that there's some fun that we, we've worked, we've done some rotations with Costco and had a really good experience. How many come in a pack at Costco? Well, we've done six in a pack at Costco okay. and they wanted the big bars because it's a whole conversation. So we've done six in one. And I think with the peanut butter cup, you know, again, the, one of the ways you, like you were asking earlier about like how to manage this letting people know what it is. And when we did the series A, we really decided to lean into the indulgence aspect. And we worked with a fun creative agency and really had a great time with that. And as we continue to grow, I think that's one way we are able to like kind of let people recognize it's an indulgence, but then, you know, it's made with five whole foods. That was my customer journey. Yeah. And I feel so much better about it. Yeah. It's amazing. So I think that, I think it's, it's being able to have more um, consumer awareness of the brand in general. And the way that we're going to do that is we'll play with form factor a little bit by offering some different sizes like this, this, and then I think just being in front of people. And part of that is like that whole food service thing. We, you know, that, that food service channel of people at the meta campus or Netflix campus who are just doing their daily thing. They might not know who Honey Mamas is, but being able to have like a little snack while they're working and then see us at the grocery store level is, I think that's kind of part of our devious plan. Meet them where they are. Yeah. I love it. Can we do a giveaway on the podcast? Yes. Okay. Let's do a giveaway. Oh, for sure. You choose the product. Okay, great. We'll choose the listener. Yeah, that sounds great. (laughs) They'll win something fun. Let's do it. Well, where can everybody find you? Where can they shop and where can they buy? Honeymamas.com is a great place to start. You can buy our products online. And then otherwise, we are in pretty much all of the natural grocery stores across the country. And then also, if you go online to honeymamas.com, if you type in your zip code, it'll show you all the stores in your area. You have two new fans, me and Nick. So good. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks for joining the podcast. Yeah, such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.